James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Please be seated. I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit differently than we normally do tonight. Turn your Bible, and the copy that I have does not have one, to the table of contents. And as you're looking at the table of contents underneath the heading, the New Testament, the first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all deal with Jesus as he lived on this earth physically. And to be real honest with you, the Old Testament law in those four books is still in effect. Then there's the book of Acts where the entirety of mankind and time changes. Throughout the book of Acts, you and I will see men and women being taught the gospel. And those men and women, men and women deciding whether or not they will obey it. It's not every time throughout the book of the Acts that you and I read about someone who was jumping at the chance to be obedient to God. As a matter of fact, we find people who turn their back on Him. There's an interesting parallel there for us. Not everyone that we teach the gospel to will, will obey it. But that doesn't excuse us from teaching. Now, as you look in your, your Bibles there, from Romans through Revelation, you have a whole different set of books. And very rarely from that point forward, after the book of Acts chapter 28, rarely do we find people who are being confronted with the gospel as much. What we generally run into from Romans through Revelation is God urging and, and pouring everything that he has out to people to convince them to stay faithful. That's the lion's share of the New Testament. Stay with me. Look back. We're 11 days short, but look back over the year that was 2020, and what you'll see is pretty much a normal year. You will. You know what you'll see? You'll see moms and dads who spent time awake worrying about the decisions their children will make. Worrying about how that will affect the rest of their lives. What you'll see when you look in 2020 is people who will be taught the gospel and accept it. Others who will be taught the gospel and refuse it. What you'll see is people who will continue to stay faithful. Others who will decide to walk away for something else. You'll see men and women who make the wrong decisions and find themselves on the losing end of a car wreck. You'll see men and women who decide to serve our nation. You'll see men and women who are retiring from serving our nation. You'll see all of us gain a year of age and hopefully wisdom. There's not much difference about tw uh, different about 2020 than was 2019. 
Uh, I guess maybe a pandemic in there. A few more people got sick. But haven't we been dealing with that all of our lives? How many times in your life, aside from this year, have you heard about the numbers of uh, older uh, men and women of our nation dying of the flu? It's really just like any other year. And I'll let you know this too. If you are like most every other Christian on this planet, if you're like most every other one, every week somehow in this year, your faith has been tested. Will you make the right decision and go here or go there? Will you choose to follow self and go to this place or that place? Have you ever had your faith tested? It's tested almost weekly, isn't it? From Romans to Revelation, as you and I look at those books, God would write to us to tell us to remain faithful, urge us to remain faithful. We find the first book ever written in the New Testament. Written somewhere around 37, maybe 38, some five, four or five years after Jesus has died on that cross. We see his half-brother, James, write a book. Now, look in your Bible and turn to James chapter number 1. James is called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Each of the verses that you and I will find will will pretty much stand alone and will pretty much remind us of how much you and I need, now don't miss that word, need God. How much we are dependent on Him. The overlying theme of the book is a very simple phrase I learned so many years ago that I wish I'd come up with because you'd say he's a genius, but he's not. A faith that has not been tested, proven true, is a faith that cannot be trusted. Life is easy when nothing comes at us. What would you do if Jesus said, follow me? I'd, do, I'd leave everything and follow him. What would you do if Jesus said, leave your family behind? What would you do if... So we look at all those situations and we say to ourselves, I, w- I tell you what I would do. And then the situation hits home. And everything becomes real. And we say, I would, but. What happened to that guy? That guy there reminds me of Peter. Just a few hours before Jesus is arrested. I'm ready to go with you everywhere. I mean, mean, except for, you know, in there where they could kind of put two and two together and say, I'm one of your followers and hang me beside you. Other than that, I'm ready to go everywhere you want me to go. Has your faith been tested this year? Look at the book of James. He's going to go over four or five different ways, uh, chapter one of how you and I are tested. And let's see if any of these things ring true with us today. Look at chapter one, verses two, three, and four. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Patience. The endure, the, the, the ability to execute endurance. Has that been tested for you this year? How about you? This would be 1873. Number 1873. 
If you're counting, that's how many, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, things, uh, videos that we have put out on our YouTube channel. 1,800. Does it feel like that? Some days, yes, huh? 1,800, does it feel like that to you? Have you had your patience tried this year? Are you still able to execute endurance? An excellent example of a man with endurance found within the Old Testament. A man who seemingly the entire world turned on him. Even his own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job would look at his wife and say, you sound like one of those silly, superstitious women. I'm not going to turn my back on God. And he was able, through that section of his life, as you and I read about that, to continue to endure even though he doesn't really know God's plan. James would tell us that the, the faith that we have or the product of the faith that we have is seen in our patience. But let patience have its perfect work or its perfecting work or its, its completing work for us. It's how you and I would execute uh, the idea of, uh, of enduring. What if 2021 is 10 times worse than 2020. Then we'll be looking forward to January the 1st of 2022. What if it's not as bad? Are we still going to endure? Are we still going to reach those who are lost via uh, any mechanism we have, whether it be internet or wherever? Are we going to endure? Has your faith been tested? Look at verse 5. The ability to execute knowledge. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and to him it shall be given. The ability to execute knowledge. Has that been tested this year? That's one, I think, that ought to be tested every day. That's one of those that uh, I know what God's Word says. Well, are you going to do it or not? And I wish it was differently and could be said differently, but that is exactly where the rubber meets the road. I know what God's Word says. Am I going to do it? Am I going to execute the wisdom to follow after the righteousness of God? And he that lacks wisdom should go to that source. He that lacks wisdom should ask God, who gives to all men liberally. But notice this first. He's not going to give to you until you ask him. And then he's going to pour it out. Has your patience been tested? Has your wisdom been tested? Notice verses 13 through 15. What about your faithfulness? Has it been tested? That's the ability to execute holiness, godliness, righteousness. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is drawn or is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. God is not the source of me being faithful or unfaithful. I am. God's not the source of you being faithful or unfaithful. You are. It is not that God would look on us and say, faithful, unfaithful, faithful, 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 unfaithful, 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 faithful. Oh, no. My faithfulness or my unfaithfulness is in direct linkage to how I view myself with God. 
First John, or rather James, rather in James chapter 1, verse 13, would start by saying, let no man say when he is tempted, he's tempted of God. God doesn't lie to us. God doesn't tempt us. We're tempted by our own lusts and desires. Which means my temptation is greatly different from yours. Your temptation is greatly different from mine. But they're there. And they're real. And it's a daily fight to keep myself living in a holy fashion. Is it for you? Maybe, I think, maybe, if I ever gain any age about me, any wisdom, perhaps that walk will become easier. Perhaps that walk as a Christian, that, that, that living up to holiness and righteousness will become easier. Maybe the devil will just get tired of me. Probably not. there is a very definite action that happened when you were baptized, when you put on Christ in baptism. You changed sides. You changed from a lost condition to a saved condition. You told, in effect, told Satan, I don't really want to be on your team anymore. Which then put you on his radar. And he has had an eye on you and has had an eye on me. And he says, what if I can make them fall? What if I can make them falter? What if I can make them doubt? What if I can have them believe that it's all just a, a laughable thing or, or a game or a cultural thing? You know, in Alabama, we go to church on Sunday. You know why? Because that's what you do in Alabama. Doesn't matter which building. It's a cultural idea of Christianity that would oversweep that uh, that nation or that, that state. When we begin to stop seeing it as cultural and start seeing it as a lifestyle, now we're doing something. Has your faithfulness been tested? Has your ability to execute holiness, has your ability to execute knowledge, your ability to execute endurance, has it been, has it been challenged this year? Has your faith been challenged? Look at verse number 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Oh, no. We get that backwards a lot. Let every man be swift to speak and slow to hear and swift to anger, right? That's, that's how we read it. If not, that's at times how we execute it. Has your faithfulness in attitude been tested this year the the ability to execute self-control swift to hear slow to speak slow to wrath i have two of those three i think i don't want to say that in a bragging fashion because that might be my downfall but i think i have two of those three down okay i am swift to hear I am slow to speak, but I am not slow to anger. Huh. Has my ability to control myself been tested this year? Well, there's a lot of things this particular year that could test those things. 
There's a lot of things this particular year that could test our self-control. What about an uncertified election? Will that test your self-control? What about a pandemic? Will that test your self-control? How many people have ever muttered this phrase as you angrily walk back to your car? I hate that stupid mask. Mm -hmm. You know how many stores I went to yesterday? Let's say five. I don't remember how many. I may have went back every single time. How to test your self-control. How to give the girls time to go into the whatever store we're in and browse at some things that give me time to uh, stand out in the parking lot and have a moment with the Lord. How many of these things this year have tested our self-control? How many times this year have we lost the battle with our self-control? And never have seen a person face to face to lose that battle. We find the anonymity of a computer screen engaging. If you hear nothing else through this particular lesson tonight, there is one sentence that is upcoming that I want you to store away in your mind for when you decide I need to tell somebody on the snappy chats or the Instagrams or the facey books, all those kinds of things, what I think. The world wide web is world wide and you're not that important. Just because I think something doesn't mean I have to say it or type it. And sometimes I can type it and then just erase it just to Get those things off of my chest. And how many times has that been an issue for us just in this year? We find our faith being tested on, on every corner. Look at chapter 1, verse 21, 26, 27. Has your religion been tested? Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceive his own heart, this man's religion is vain, pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You want to look at the idea of how to practice or execute the religion that God would have. The religion that God would tell us about in His Word. How many times has that been tested this year? First of all, it's tested almost on a daily basis just simply by denominational doctrine that's out there. How many times through the year do we have to fight the fact that mankind is not saved by belief only? He's not saved to never be lost again. That he's not saved because of where he lives or who his mom and daddy was or any number of things. Our teen class over the past, I guess, quarter uh, has been participating on Wednesday nights in debates. The first debate they had Uh, We took the opening statement with Mr. Dan Barker and uh, Kyle Butt, uh, where Dan Barker would assert that uh, the God of the Bible does not exist. And uh, we let him have his say on, uh, on that video. And then we stopped it, and they rebutted again and did a good job. Our last debate, they had to debate me. Unfortunately, I had to be the guy on the wrong side, and every time I got up, I said, listen, I don't believe this, but in order to have a debate, you have to have somebody on the wrong side. And they debated why we sing, why we partake of the Lord's Supper, girls' participation, one church, and there's one other I'm missing, Romans 10, 9 and 10. 
faith only saves. They debated those things and they did remarkably well. Show of hands, how many of you have been a member of the church for 10 years? Or 20? 30? 40? 50? And everybody else. I won't go past 50. Would you like to debate them? Would you like to stand up against these who have been alive less time than most of us have been Christians and debate them on why we do what we do? So I'm going to tell you what, they know it. And that's a good thing because you're going to need it. Because you're going to run into people who say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? And they're going to attack God's religion. They're going to attack God's church from every single angle. And you're going to wish you knew where those things were. And one of these days, you might even look at me and go, well, that was kind of helpful. Good. Because here's what we did not do when we were teens. We didn't go through those classes in that fashion, to be able to give those answers. And the, the youth group I grew up in, that Miss Brandy grew up in, had somewhere around 40 or so. There may be five of us still faithful. Because they didn't know how to answer the attack. Because the religion that they knew and, and knew all their life had been attacked, and, and all they could say was, uh... Because mama and daddy said so. Why don't you go there? Because that's where the car ends up. And because they had no root to that religion, they found their faith being tested and them crumbling to the test. And because there's no root to the patience or the wisdom or the faithfulness or the attitudes that we have, we find those things crumbling and then we look at ourselves and say, well, what am I supposed to do now? They've heard this too. And let me assure you that these five P's of life are just as good, spiritually speaking, as they are physically speaking. Prior preparation prevents poor performances. You want to be faithful? You better start now. You want to be able to answer those questions, you better start studying now. Why? Because they're coming, you better be ready for them. 2020 is not any different than 2019. And with the possible exception of a pandemic, it won't be any different than 2021. The, the, the lion's share of the New Testament is urging us to stay faithful to God. And as we read James chapter 1, we read at least five different ways where God asks us, have we been faithful? Now, let me ask you this question. Have you been faithful? Being faithful unto God is, is more than just um, finding yourselves geographically here on Sunday, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. This is the fruit of faithfulness. I may go to Michael's house tomorrow, and he may say, I've got an apple tree in my backyard. Why don't you come and see it? And I go back there and look at that tree, and it has oranges hanging all over it. What do I know? A couple of things. Michael don't know the difference between an apple and an orange. But I know that ain't an apple tree. When I look at the fruit, I can tell what kind of plant it is. As a matter of fact, Jesus would tell us that. They're going to know you by your fruits. They're going to see what you do, and they're going to think something and assume something about you, and nine times out of ten, the assumption they make is going to be right. Can people look at my life and the fruits of my life and say, that fellow right there is a faithful Christian? Or do they look at my, me and the fruit of my life and say, I don't, I don't know, maybe. 
Unfortunately, too many times, the answer is, I don't know, maybe. I need you to know something about God. I need you to understand something about the mindset of God as he would look at his children and say this, it doesn't have to be that way. Just because it is that way does not mean it has to be that way. God would look at us and say, just because you find yourself being unfaithful does not mean you have to stay there. Look at him in, in Luke chapter 16. As he's standing, uh, mentioned in that parable, he's standing and he's looking out, Luke chapter 15, I'm sorry. He's looking out for that son, that prodigal son who has been in that hog pen. And I can see him every day as he's on that roof. He's looking for that, that son to the north and to the east, the west and the south. Just searching the horizon for that son. Before that son ever peaks over the horizon, you know what I know? He is welcome back. That father's waiting on him. Wants him to be there. It is pulling for him to be faithful unto his family. Wants him desperately. There's something that you and I need to, to uh, take away from that father in that parable. God wants you. God desperately wants you. He wants you enough that he sent his son for you. He wants you to stay faithful. He's not up there waiting and hoping, boy, I hope I can strike him down today. I hope they'll stay faithful. I hope they'll be my children. I hope they'll continue down this path, and I hope I can give them heaven. But it all depends on what I do. How I live. And if I find myself faithful to him. For you who haven't been baptized, who haven't put on Christ in baptism, you should do that. Matter of fact, you need to do that. Your soul's in jeopardy. You need to hear what God has to say and believe that. Repent of your sin. Confess that Jesus is the Christ. Be buried in baptism. Have those sins washed away. You need to do that. The most important decision You'll ever make in your life is that one. Number one B is right behind it. And that is to remain faithful. And as you, brother or sister, put your life up against the standard of God's word. Do you find yourself as a reflection of Christ? If not, end this year better than we've lived it. Start next year off right come back home to him and be faithful to him and do that right now while we stand and sing uh,